Um, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you everybody for uh, attending my talk. Uh, I want to start by saying I'm really sad that I can't uh, join you in person uh, in Toulouse and I, uh, this has been a very crazy year and I really hope uh, to see you all in person uh, maybe next year. Yeah, so uh, my talk will be um, uh, about looking at blockchain technology through the lens of game theory. Uh, this will be an open-ended talk. I will mainly focus on challenges and open questions. Uh, and some of the open questions I will, I will mention, there has been a lot of work and progress in. So in, it's not my goal to uh, uh, critique or to insult current work. It's more about trying to uh, uh, focus on what are the big challenges and, and what are the interesting questions uh, in my view. So uh, the focus here really is about blockchain, but, but as you know, there is a deep connection between uh, blockchain and computer science. And uh, my main uh, uh, background is from computer science. And, and this is kind of my interest, the intersection of blockchain and computer science. But obviously there is a, a huge impact also on economics. And I believe that this multidisciplinary view uh, is very important. So seeing both the practical aspects of uh, blockchains, both the view from computer science and, and extremely important view of, of economics. And really, you know, along this talk, I want you to imagine an imaginary meeting between uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and, uh, and uh, John, John Nash. And, and what we will go is through several types of uh, uh, challenges or, or things where there might be areas of intersection. And I will focus on four of them. So I will talk about uh, modeling money endogenously, and then I will talk mainly about trust. This will be kind of the big, the big, the main part of, of this talk. And then incentivizing fairness and incentivizing welfare. Uh, each one of these are going to be separate uh, parts. So, you know, if you lose focus, if you are uh, bored and so on, you can kind of regain and restart in the next uh, item. So don't worry about it. Uh, and so, um, you know, Satoshi, we don't know a lot about uh, him or her or this group, um, but we do know that uh, uh, Nash is a famous uh, mathematician. So this will be focused really on some of the uh, foundational mathematical questions uh, in this space, in particular in, in the game theoretic view of blockchain technology. So yeah, the first uh, uh, topic is about how to model money, because I think in some sense, if you look at, at kind of the cryptocurrency world and, and really the, the breakthrough of Bitcoin, it is a new approach to, to basically generate money in a digital manner. Uh, and this is a real breakthrough in the world. Uh, and, and the question here is what are the tools, the game theoretic tools, the economic tools to model this type of technology? And so I highly encourage you to uh, read this, uh, this white paper. It's, it's uh, very well written. And, and I will show some parts of it during, during this talk. So here's, I think, maybe the first or second sentence in this uh, 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 Bitcoin white paper. Uh, what is needed is an electronic payment system based on crypt cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two parties to transact directly with each other without a need for a trusted third party. So if we see here, there are a few um, uh, interesting aspects here. One is um, this idea that there is a, an electronic payment system. And so really there is a focus on how to reduce the friction uh, and allowing people to pay where all you need is just two willing parties. So there is no need, there is no other entities that need to, to give you payment. Uh, and the second aspect here that I'd like to highlight is, is the removal of a trusted third party. So in many sense, uh, the goal was to provide something that has low friction in terms of payments uh, and also reduces kind of the need for a trusted third party. So if you look at the traditional way that uh, money is, is defined, typically it's defined kind of ex exogenously as, as an external um, measure. And you know, typically if you look at economics, then you see things like you want money to be a medium of exchange. So money is a way where we can kind of transfer utility from one to another, or we can uh, exchange value. Um, of course, we can always exchange uh, uh, sand. Sand is a good way to exchange things. The problem is that uh, at least in some granularities, sand is not very scarce. So you need something that there is a, a 
very few of. And so scarcity is a very important property uh, of, of money. The other problem is that uh, maybe the allocation of sand is not completely equal. If I live in the mountains, maybe I have less sand available for me. And if I live near the sea, uh, near the beach, then maybe I have more sand. So you want to have something that uh, um, uh, provides some, somehow an equal scarcity to, to participants. Uh, and, and so, you know, you could imagine maybe taking an orange as a, as a good type of money system and, you know, I can exchange oranges. Uh, oranges are relatively scarce. There's a limited amount of or oranges in the world. The problem maybe with oranges is that uh, they might not be a very good store of value. And so the problem is that maybe over time, uh, oranges uh, lose their ability and they rot and, and they go away. And so one of the important parts of money is that you would actually like their value or their utility for you to remain over time. And so, you know, if it's, a, if it's something physical, like a metal, like gold, then maybe it has a longevity. If it's something that depends on, let's say, a sovereign state, then your value depends on the sovereignty of the state. And for example, if the state gets conquered or it gets eliminated, then uh, maybe you, you, your money is at risk. So these are kind of challenges that typically are just uh, uh, defined away uh, and you know what Bitcoin does is really tries to uh, create uh, solutions for these things. In particular, you know, gives a, a electronic method of payment. It creates kind of a digital scarcity by defining a, a, a limit of 21 million uh, bitcoins. Uh, and really, the idea here is that there is no central bank or or one person. Uh, they're trying to replace this third party by by this uh, ledger technology. And you know, if you look at kind of the traditional game theoretic approach, then you know you you have a, a utility function which is a preference over over outcomes, and you just model money as some external, you know, rational number, positive rational number, and you know, so it's just one of them. Uh, people typically want more money, so uh, if you have more money, then your utility is is uh, is greater. All things being equal, uh, and and money is kind of a, a way to transfer utility. And I think you know this this modeling is good in some cases, but but in reality, what we're seeing is that there are many different types of money systems. So I mentioned oranges, sand, gold, and monetary systems of sovereign states, and now we're seeing these new type of approaches, uh, like like in in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And so the question is, how can we measure and how can we uh, compare between different types of money systems? And so really what I'm asking here is, is kind of a microeconomic theory that talks about the competition between money systems. In particular, a type of um, uh, theory that manages to define money endogenously by assigning utility for money systems based on these uh, beneficial properties. So in particular, you, know, you want a money system to have more utility uh, when it can reduce friction, right? So if the cost of exchange is low, and then you would like to have a you you imagine that that would increase the utility of that money system versus let's say a, a different system where the uh, friction is is higher. Similarly, you want to have some sort of uh, fairness in the allocation of a scarce resource. So that would might, might also be a measure of of how uh, how much value you get from a monetary system. And finally, you know you want to have these mon money systems be a good store of value. And so really the question is trying to come up with a way to measure these properties of friction, fairness, and trust. And you know, Bitcoin tries to solve it in one way. Uh, it uses electronic payments based on, on cryptography. So this is kind of their approach of reducing friction. Uh, it creates a limited supply and it uses um, Byzantine fault tolerance uh, and creating kind of a replicated state machine among all miners for trust. And we'll talk more about Byzantine fault tolerance. And so the, the, the first uh, uh, open question I want to present is kind of coming up with a game theoretic endogenous theory uh, for the utility of money systems. And in particular, this type of theory should be able to capture the benefits um, or drawbacks of systems that have low friction, high fairness, and high trust. Great, so I'm gonna to go to the second part and this is gonna be the, the um, main part and I'm gonna talk about this notion of trust. Um, and, and there's gonna be th three separate uh, uh, parts here um, and we will try to explain what does that mean that there is a uh, uh, trust in, in the system. 
Um, and then we'll maybe talk about who is actually maintaining this trust. And uh, thirdly, there's a typo here, of course, this should be um, trust and scalability. Um, so, so the first thing really to, to ask ourselves is, is kind of, uh, you know, what does it mean to, to, re to not have a trusted third party? And let's go back to, to Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, white paper. And before he goes on and explains kind of the Bitcoin approach, it, they talk about kind of a, a common solution. And so the common solution is just to have a trusted central authority. Uh, and, you know, in their point of view, the problem with this solution is that the entire fate of the money system depends on the company running the mint and every transaction has to go them just like a bank. So obviously, um, you know, the writers of this white paper did not uh, like banks, uh, but really you, you can see that what they were afraid of is that when you give control to a monetary system, to some other entity, some central authority, then what they were worried about is that this authority might actually um, cause your value to be reduced over time. And you know, there are uh, inflationary pressures and, and there are different types of risks. And so Satoshi Nakamoto this wanted to build a solution where there was no uh, central authority or where at least this, uh, this authority was distributed among many participants. And so how did they do this? So here is kind of a, a very famous uh, uh, email that, that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, uh, sent uh, as a response about a month after the white paper. And this is kind of, uh, for me as, as a computer scientist working on this problem of Byzantine, the Byzantine generals problem, this is a very uh, influential uh, email. And really it shows that, that the writers of, of the white paper already knew in 2018 that the core new idea uh, in, in kind of Bitcoin's uh, uh, ledger, this is a proof of work chain, is that it solves the Byzantine generals problem. And basically the Byzantine generals problem is a way to instantiate a, a distributed authority that is replicated among multiple miners so that there is no central uh, node. There is basically a consensus protocol running up, um, along multiple different nodes. And so really, you know, I would like to highlight the differences between the view of, of uh, Byzantine fault tolerance and, and game theory. Because if you think about them initially, it seems like these are completely different uh, worlds. So, you know, in distributed computing, in the world where you look at this problem of Byzantine fault tolerance, typically, you know, you assume that there are good guys and bad guys. And typically we say there's N nodes in total and maybe F of them are bad. So F measures the amount of uh, bad guys. And, and what is our goal? Our goal is to build a protocol. A protocol is just a strategy. Uh, and we want it to be tolerant to an adversary controlling F bad guys. And so what does it mean that it's uh, tolerant? It can uh, 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 tolerate this adversary. Well, what it formally means, I mean, informally, sorry, it means that uh, no matter which set of F players the adversary controls, if the good guys are running the honest protocol, uh, then these good properties of the protocol hold. So in particular, if we want to uh, hold things like no double spend, then this property is, is being held. And this, uh, this simple definition is a key notion of uh, Byzantine fault tolerance in distributed computing and cryptography. And when you look at game theory, uh, it seems extremely uh, different because in game theory, there are no good guys and bad guys. We just assume there are N players and they're all rational. So on the, you know, in the first layer, when you look at things, it looks like these are completely two different worlds that have no connection. But once you go a little bit deeper into the definitions, you realize that there is a very deep connection. And in a sense, uh, these things are much similar than, than what uh, uh, pe people believe. So in particular, uh, in game theory, uh, what does it mean that a, a protocol or a strategy is robust to a coalition of size F or a coalition robust equilibrium? Well, it means that no matter who the coalition of F parties are, if all the other players are playing the prescribed strategy and the coalition plays their best response to these other players, then the properties of the protocol hold. In particular, if the properties were no double spend, then this is kind of the properties that we will have. And this is a key notion of coalition resistant equilibrium uh, in, in game theory. And so if you look at these two definitions, you realize that really the only thing that's different here is kind of this, this one uh, a line that requires that the 
that the coalition actually plays a best response. And so this best response uh, is, is what uh, is the difference between imagining that the players have arbitrary utility. And so we basically say no matter what they do versus a rational adversary where we can assume best response. But really you can model this best response also in the distributed computing space. And you can view um, the, the notion of Byzantine fault tolerance and, and consensus as a game theoretic notion where you want to seek a coalition to resistant equilibrium. And you know, this, this uh, idea obviously appears in, in many papers, but actually when I read the, the uh, uh, Bitcoin white paper, I see that the, uh, the writers there also had very good intuition um, about game theory and had a very similar view. So here is kind of a, you know, one piece of text. If a greedy attacker, and you can imagine a greedy attacker is just a rational player, is able to assemble more CPU than all the honest player, players, um, he would have to choose, and here he has to choose a best response, right? This is what a, a, a rational player does, between uh, using it to defraud people or using it to generate new coins. And what the author of the white paper says is that he ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules. And as you know, whenever you prove that uh, the thing that's most profitable is to play by the rules, this is essentially that you are proving a equilibrium strategy. Again, a coalition resistant equilibrium strategy. So in a way, you know, even the uh, Bitcoin white paper is already trying to implicitly prove that there is a um, coalition resistant equilibrium that is causing people to reach consensus and not to deviate and uh, double spend. And so I guess the high level open question here is kind of formalizing this more and uh, providing a game theoretic uh, theory of consensus and a game theoretic analog to Byzantine fault tolerance. And again, there has been a lot of work in this topic and even uh, you know, today and, and in the next few days, you will see more work on it. Um, so I really think it, what we're missing is kind of uh, you know, a, a better understanding. There are still areas where, where we maybe need a more clear uh, notion and, and, and clear theory around this topic. Um, but you know, anytime you have a Byzantine fault tolerant system, the question really is, uh, who are those players or parties that are decentralizing the trust and running this consensus protocol? And so really the people who are running this consensus protocol are the people who are allowed to vote because in a sense, a consensus or a Byzantine fault tolerance uh, uh, system is a system where people are allowed to vote. And so this is kind of the next thing which, which I'll talk about, which is, you know, who is actually maintaining this, uh, this, this uh, ledger? And so, you know, this question of uh, who is allowed to vote is an important question in, in the world in general. And, uh, uh, you know, let's say taking in, in France, this uh, idea that all adult males are allowed to vote is quite radical. It's, it's very new. It's only maybe a few hundred years. And uh, the idea that uh, adult women are allowed to vote is, uh, you know, is, is less than 100 years old. So uh, really the, the distribution of power um, is a very important aspect. And similarly, you know, in, in the US, uh, the idea that adult women are allowed to vote is, is maybe just 100 years old. Um, and and th the point here is that uh, by choosing who is allowed to vote, that is basically saying how we distribute power. And no matter what consensus protocol we run, uh, we are running it on the people that we provide power to run it for. And so by deciding who is allowed to, allowing to vote, we are making a very important um, uh, decision about our system. And so in, you know, in computer science, the way we model this is by having an adversary and we restrict the adversary voting power. And so in particular in Bitcoin, you know, we assume that the adversary controls less than 51% of the mining. And you know, here is kind of a, a quote from the Bitcoin white paper. The system is secure as long as the honest nodes collectively control more CPU than any cooperating group of attacking nodes. So again, you can see that the uh, uh, Bitcoin white paper already understands this notion of providing voting power by CPU. Uh, and, uh, and making sure that there is an adversary that controls less than one half. But you can really ask yourself, you know, is this the right way um, to, to spread voting? And we're seeing a lot of other approaches. So, you know, there is kind of this uh, 
traditional approach of proof of membership, where every member has one vote. There's obviously this idea of proof of work, uh, and this is what uh, Bitcoin is using. We are seeing now a lot of systems move to this idea of proof of stake, where basically there is uh, some coin and the more coins you have, the more voting power you have. So, you know, if you have more dollars, you get more voting powers, or if you have more Ethereum, then you have more voting powers. And we're also seeing kind of, you know, new technology talking about um, proof of space and proof of replication and interesting at variants of that. And, and you know, this, this idea of, of, uh, of uh, proof of work and is this the right way to distribute voting power uh, is an open question. And, you know, I will cite here a uh, work from 2018, which talks about kind of decentralization in Bitcoin and Ethereum, showing that actually there are relatively few mining pools. Um, there's actually very few ASIC providers. So there is kind of a monopoly on the production of a voting machine, of, of, of voting uh, power. And so what we're seeing is that there is risks that proof of work is causing centralization. Proof of work prefers central, certain geographic regions, in particular areas that have a lot of access electricity. Uh, and also, you know, proof of work prefers places that have a, a, a preferred taxation uh, for these types of uh, activities. And, and, you know, another worry is that proof of work is, is wasteful. It, it, uh, it uses a lot of uh, uh, energy, even though, you know, there are arguments saying that some of it is basically uh, excess energy that, that can't be sold uh, in the marketplace. And so kind of the microeconomic thesis here is that potentially um, buying a proof of work system is essentially just using your money to buying voting. And so the question here really is how can we avoid a system where the number of votes you have just depends on the number of, of uh, money that you have. And so this kind of big open question is, you know, how to avoid monopolies, how to avoid centralization, and how to avoid bribery, basically making somebody that has a lot of money uh, pay you in order to uh, cause you to vote for, for uh, its, its needs. Yeah, so the third part of this uh, uh, incentivizing trust will be about uh, uh, trust and scalability. So in the first part, we talked about um, kind of a game theoretic model for consensus. In the second part, we talked about um, kind of a theory around who is allowed to vote and what is the right way to allocate votes. And in the third one, I would like to uh, go to a vignette that talks about how to scale blockchains, because as you know, this is kind of one of the uh, big uh, challenges that people are handling in the this year, uh, and I guess in the last two or three years in particular. Uh, and, and really, this is kind of a, you know, a technical challenge. This is not just a, a game theoretic challenge, but I will highlight kind of the economic and game theoretical aspects here. So if you think about a, a, a blockchain system, there are many things that you can try to improve in order to scale and have more transactions per second. So one is, you know, you want to have a better consensus protocol. And this is what I do for, for a living. I could talk for hours about consensus protocols, but I'm not going to do it today. Uh, the second is basically data availability. So really, you know, no matter how much you do consensus, at the end of the day, if you need to record data, then you have a cost of putting that data on some sort of immutable ledger. And so that will be a, a uh, scalability bottleneck. And there are ways of sharding, which basically allow you to split your data and not write it everywhere. Or uh, a different approach would be to write it everywhere, but not to execute it everywhere. And what we're seeing is that this third part uh, is actually the most challenging one. So in particular, after you actually reach consensus on what the content of the block is, and after you have the block, the data of the block reaches everybody, so you have data availability, the real bottleneck in terms of scalability is to execute the transactions. And in particular, in a replicated state machine like, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or all these blockchain systems, you, you, you are probably executing it after somebody already executed it. So in particular, you are validating somebody else's execution. And so if there are hundreds or thousands of validators, then hundreds or thousands of people have to re-execute and revalidate all the transactions. And by far, this uh, execution and val validation is the scalability bottleneck in the sense that consensus and data availability can run much faster. And what we're seeing is that in many workloads, uh, execution is kind of the hardest uh, 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 bottleneck. And so today, as I mentioned, you know, every miner or every validator must execute all transactions. 
Uh, and there's kind of this uh, very promising solution that uh, gained prominence uh, in, in the last year, but, but actually appears in kind of um, computer science literature for, for you know, over, over 10 years. And the idea here is that instead of all of us executing, we will just have a few uh, 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 agents that will execute. And these agents will have some uh, uh, stake, some bond. So they have to uh, uh, deposit some bond. And once they execute, they have to report what is the aggregate res result of their execution. And then if they cheat, then there is a way for other people to post a challenge or a proof that they cheated, that they did not execute correctly. And uh, they get a reward if they are correct, if they are correct in proving a fraud. And the executor that uh, cheated, the bond that they posted uh, gets uh, slashed or gets, uh, they get some sort of punishment. And so again, this is something that uh, if you are in the uh, uh, macroeconomic world, you, you should know this is a classical problem of a principal agent uh, with deep ties, obviously, to computer science. But really, the idea here is that there is a principal that wants transactions to be aggregated. This is kind of the society that wants to have high degree of scalability. And then there are these agents. These agents are validators. And uh, the naive thing to do is basically that uh, every miner just uh, uh, executes all transactions. And so this is kind of one way. You just have uh, all the agents rerun everything. So every agent is verifying every other agent. Um, but you want to say, are there game theoretic mechanisms that could allow you to uh, incentivize people to behave honestly uh, and to punish them if they are lazy or malicious? And so this is kind of uh, the third question around trust and scalability, which is kind of a game theoretic framework um, for scalable validation. Good, so I will move to the third part. And in this third part, I will talk about uh, fairness and uh, uh, incentivizing fairness. So again, let's go back to the uh, Bitcoin white paper. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see this very clear and very simple approach um, of how to incentivize nodes uh, to support the network. And so the, the idea is very simple. The idea is that uh, in a block, the first transaction is a special transaction that awards new coins to the creator of the block. And so this is a way to incentivize nodes to support the network. Uh, but also crucially, this is a way to distribute coins into circulation. So you know there is this question of how do you add coins to circulation. So for example, one way is to say, well, I have uh, um, uh, francs, and now I will move from francs to euros. So there will be some conversion rate, and everybody who has francs, they can replace them to euros. And this way, I can create new circulation of euros by matching them to some different coin. Or I can basically start new coins from scratch, from zero. And this is the approach that Bitcoin took. And basically, every coin that is created is created from a uh, transaction inside the block. And this, this uh, both gives you incentive and also adds more money into circulation. And again, this was because they did not want any uh, central authority to issue uh, uh, th these coins. But they basically said that whoever mines a new block gets a new coin. So this is a very uh, uh, elegant idea. Uh, the, the, however, you know what, what we're seeing is that there, there are some challenges with this idea, and, and in particular, you know we're getting kind of this uh, effect that uh, it, large coalitions might try to to gain uh, and have more advantage relative to smaller coalitions that have less uh, less to gain, and this kind of again causes this centralization problem, where uh, larger groups have an advantage relative to smaller groups. And here's this nice quote by, by Percy Blythe Shelley. Yeah, so you, you, know, you want a money system to be fair. And actually, defining fairness is, is a little bit challenging. Um, but you know, one way that you can define uh, a type of fairness is this notion of chain quality. 
And roughly speaking, chain quality means that the amount of reward that, uh, that uh, you receive is proportional to the fraction of your voting power. So remember, we said that these consensus protocols have some voting power. So you know, if I have 10% of the voting power, roughly speaking, a fair solution would give me 10% of the rewards. This is one way to define uh, fairness. Um, and you know, it, this is really a big question. How do you uh, initially allocate money? I don't think there are uh, easy answers to this, but we can see how Bitcoin does it. So Bitcoin gives new coins to the miner of a block. Um, but there is kind of a technical aspect here that you actually only receive this money if this block becomes part of the longest chain, right? So in Bitcoin, there's this longest chain, um, but if your block uh, is not part of the longest chain, even though you mine the block, you do not get paid. And this is kind of uh, implicit inside the protocol. And so, uh, you know, this small technical aspect actually uh, opens up an attack surface where if you are an orphan, if you basically are connected to the chain, but nobody extends you, people extend some other longest chain, then you get no reward. And this kind of gives us this notion of selfish mining, and this is kind of a famous attack. And in a sense, one way to think about selfish mining is that this is a strategy that uh, can increase the probability of people that are outside of your coalition to become orphans. And by increasing the probability of other people to, to become orphans, you basically decrease their fair share. And when you decrease their fair share, you are implicitly increasing your share unfairly. And so you are getting a larger chain quality. And so this is kind of a challenge with, with selfish mining, which is that there is a, a way to, to attack that increases your share relative to everybody else. The problem with this attack is it actually requires a large coalition to succeed. And moreover, the advantage you have from this attack increases as you have long, larger coalitions. And so a small coalition might not benefit at all, but a larger coalition uh, might have a, a, a major benefit in doing selfish mining attacks. And so really this is kind of this uh, problem where these types of attack incentivize being centralized or joining kind of a, a cartel. Uh, and it really kind of highlights this problem of a uh, rich get richer. So at a very high level, here's kind of the uh, selfish mining uh, uh, attack. Uh, so, so, you know, you have, uh, uh, let's say three blocks. And now what the attacker does is it creates a hidden block. So instead of exposing this block, it creates an, a block, but does not report it to the system. And then some victim block comes in. And since the, your, your red uh, attacker did not expose this block, then this victim block just connects to the previous block. And at that point, this uh, uh, hidden attacker can publish a second public uh, block. And now you can see that there, is a, there are two chains. One chain is of length four, and this other chain is of length five. And since the protocol actually uh, encourages you to, to continue the longest chain, then the remaining next blocks will continue the red uh, uh, blocks of the attacker. And so this light blue block becomes an orphan block, basically a block that does not get reward. Uh, and so there are you know, many different types of approaches to, to uh, defend against this, this kind of idea of an uncle reward where you can add links um, to these orphan blocks and that can give you some payment. And um, you know, this has still been shown uh, to be susceptible to selfish mining. Uh, there are kind of academic work, uh, Fruit Chain is one that I will mention that allows you to um, uh, restrict selfish mining. Uh, and, and they basically show that there is kind of a strategy which is an epsilon best response. Um, and so, you know, deviating from the strategy is always profitable, but if nobody is deviating, then you get kind of a good uh, uh, equilibrium. Um, you know, another challenge with this solution is that it kind of differs from the standard longest fork, uh, longest chain wins. It, it, it kind of requires two different types of blocks. Uh, and, and there is recent work uh, uh, that, that, that is to be published soon uh, with my colleagues, uh, Danny Dolev, Itai Yal, and Joe Halperin, that kind of tries to improve on fruit chain by basically showing an epsilon best response where deviating is almost always not profitable. 
Uh, and in, in addition, it kind of uh, tries to use a very similar uh, approach uh, uh, like Ethereum, that you basically just have to add links to orphans. And so uh, I'd like to kind of conclude with the fourth uh, uh, part, which is about uh, welfare. Uh, and so again, let's go back to uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. And you know, we've talked until now just about the miners, but actually this is a market where there are miners, but there's also clients uh, that want to be served by the system. And these clients want to um, send transactions. The value that they receive is, is kind of value from uh, um, this system providing them a, a way to store their money and execute contracts on it. And so here's what uh, uh, Nakamoto authors say, the incentive can also be funded with a transaction fees. If the output value of a transaction is less than the input value, the difference is a transaction fee that is added to the incentive value of the block containing the transaction. So this is a very simple mechanism um, where basically clients can, can provide additional payment tips to the uh, creators of a block. And you can imagine uh, this as kind of a, um, a, a game theoretic notion where in a sense clients, the reason they are paying is that they are getting some value out of the system. They are paying for trust, for security. Uh, and the miners have costs. They have to maintain the blockchain. This is an expensive endeavor. And so really you want to have some sort of solution where uh, buyers will pay sellers and, and uh, compensate them for their work. Um, and you know, this is essentially a mechanism design choice. And if you think about like Bitcoin or Ethereum, today essentially this is a first price auction with a limited uh, block size. So you know, the highest bidders uh, pay, they pay their bidded price. Uh, and whatever is entered inside the block is, is what is being uh, paid. Um, obviously, you know, the size of this block is kind of a big debate in the uh, Bitcoin community, and, and I will not go into it today, but this is an, another interesting um, mechanism, mechanism design question. And, and really, you can ask yourself, well, you know, what's wrong with other types of solutions like second price auctions, and wh why haven't people used uh, second price auctions? And indeed, kind of this is because second prices uh, type auctions are, are not robust to collusion uh, in between buyers or between buyers and sellers. And so, you know, another approach would be to use kind of a fixed price mechanism. And I guess fixed price mechanisms have, have other problems of how do you actually decide what is this fixed price? And, you know, I would like to highlight kind of, you know, one of the um, most interesting advances in the last few months. This is this uh, Ethereum uh, improvement process 1559 that has become very famous. And I guess part of the idea here is that uh, uh, the, the, the payments that the, that the clients provide, some of it is a fixed price. This fixed price depends on the recent congestion and that fixed price actually gets burned. And anything beyond this fixed price is actually an optional tip um, that allows you to kind of handle congestion uh, from the uh, miner side. And so one of the interesting aspects here is that actually burning this price is a sort of a taxation policy. And this is kind of an interesting aspect of viewing blockchains as a public good. And basically by burning money, we are reducing the amount of money in circulation. And that basically increases the value of everybody that's holding uh, um, th this type of cryptocurrency. And so again, this I think is kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, approach. And so, yeah, with this, I, I, will, I will conclude. Uh, here's kind of a summary of uh, the open questions that, uh, that I discussed. We talked about four different things, about modeling money endogenously, about incentivizing trust, and about incentivizing fairness and uh, welfare. So thank you very much. Uh, and if we, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll be happy to uh, to take some. If not, then we can do it, uh, uh, you know, doing the using the chat.